Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so if we, uh, if we know what the model is, then we can just compare the observation to the model and we can work out the bias in the observations. However, our problem comes when there's a bias in the model. So in this case, um, this green line, is no longer centered over the truth. And so um, when we compare the observations to the model, we're comparing them to the model bias. And so the observations would be corrected wrongly towards the model bias, they'd be pulled towards the model bias. So we can overcome this using unbiased observations. And I might refer to these as anchor observations. And these might, oops, sorry. Uh, these might have some random errors. So they're not completely centered over the truth, or well, they're not completely on the truth, but um, in general, on average, we're assuming that they're unbiased. So now we have another frame of reference. So instead of just comparing the observations to the model, we can also compare the observations to the, um, to the unbiased observations. And so therefore, because we have another frame of reference, the unbiased observations just anchor the system back down. So I think I've just realized that I've sent uh, oh no, yeah, <laughs> I sent a different um, presentation, that's fine. Um, so just some examples of um, anchor observations. I did have a nice picture from the ECMWF data coverage um, website, ECMWF website of radio sons, but I have included the wrong presentation. So, um, Radio sons can be used as unbiased observations, but in general, they're quite sparse. So particularly over the Southern hemisphere and in the oceans, they'll be more sparse. Um, so another form of uh, anchor observations we can use are radio sons. So these cover a lot more of the, the globe, but in general, they'll probably most be useful in the stratosphere and the upper troposphere. So although radio, so sorry, sorry, um, Although unbiased observations are useful in reducing the contamination of model bias in um, observation bias correction, we can't fully rely on the unbiased observations because they're not everywhere as much as we'd like them to be. So this work looks at how we can reduce the contamination of model bias on the estimate of the observation bias using these anchor observations. And particularly, we're looking at the importance of the location of the anchor observations. So because they're sparse, we're interested in where um, model bias is going to be more dominant in the observation bias correction and where the unbiased observations are most useful. So first of all, this is the VARBC equation. So um, this top equation is just like our normal analysis equation. So we have the state analysis is the state background plus some sensitivity to observations. In VARBC, we're just um, calculating another term. So this is beta, and this is just our bias correction coefficient. 
So within this C, this is our bias correction of the observation. And our beta is just um, an estimate within that bias correction. So in this case, I've also extended um, these equations so that we now have two types of observations. So this first observation, Y1, are our biased observations, and these are bias corrected. And uh, the second observations are these Y2s, and these are the unbiased or anchor observations. And the only difference in our equations of these are that they're just not bias corrected. Um, the Ks are the sensitivities, so the Kxs are the sensitivities of the state to the biased observation and unbiased observation, and the K-betas are the same, but the sensitivities to the bias coefficient to the biased and the unbiased observation. So ultimately, we're interested in when this beta A is contaminated by model bias, because if we have the wrong estimate of beta A in this, in our next cycle, the observation bias correction will be wrong. So um, to look at the bias in beta A or bias in the bias coefficient analysis, we can extend this top equation um, so that we get an error equation for it. And then uh, we can take the expected value. So these uh, like triangular brackets just mean the expected value. So here the expected value of the bias coefficient analysis is equal to the error in the bias coefficient background the bias in the bias corrected observations. Um, this V contains both the bias coefficient and the state. Um, so this is the background bias in both the state and the bias coefficient. And then we have our, our unbiased observations. So um, this is not looking very nice at the moment. So we can make some assumptions just to simplify it. So first of all, um, we can assume that the unbiased observations are unbiased. So we can set this to zero. We can also assume that the biased observations, when they're corrected with the true uh, state and bias coefficient, that those are unbiased. And then because ultimately we're interested in when there's um, model bias. So we're thinking about when there's background bias in the state. For the first cycle, we're going to assume that there's no bias in the bias coefficient background. So we're just isolating the effect of um, the state background bias. So if we make these assumptions, then we come to this equation. So this is the bias in the bias coefficient analysis. And this is just a product of the sensitivity of the bias coefficient to the biased observations, the um, linearized biased observation operator, um, this I minus D, which I'll come on to, and then the state background. So this D is just a term that we've defined, and it's the ratio between the background error covariances and the sum of the background and observation error covariances. So if we want to reduce any bias in this beta A, we want to look at how we can reduce these terms. So we're assuming that we're not actually correcting for any kind of model bias. So we're assuming that we can't change this um, term here. And we're also going to assume that we can't change these first two terms, because if we want to, if we reduce those, it would mean not using the biased observations in our estimate of the bias coefficient, and it, it would be kind of pointless. So we're interested in how to reduce this I minus D transpose term, which is what I'll look at in a second. Um, so as I kind of explained at the beginning, anchor observations don't observe everywhere. So in our, in our setup of this, we assume that the anchor observations, which I've kind of shown by this blue circle, only observe states in what we call X2. So they only observe half of the state. Whereas biased observations, which are these red circles, could observe anywhere in X1. So they could observe different states to the anchor observations, or they could observe anywhere in X2. So they could observe the same states as the biased observations. So within this, I'll look at three cases. And I'll put in model bias into different parts of the state and look at how the anchor observations can reduce the contamination of model bias in each case. So in this first one, um, this red, these red lines um, show the model bias. So I've added model bias into X2. So the anchor observations observe model bias and the biased observations may or may not observe 
model bias. So first of all, um, if the biased observations observe different states to the anchor observations, so we're looking at this H11 compared to the H2, then um, we want less information to be shared between the background states so that less information about the model bias is passed into the biased observation. And this comes from this term here, so this D term. And it just means reducing the background error covariances so that this term reduces to zero. In the second case, where the biased observations are observing the same states as the anchor observations, then we want the anchor observations to be more precise than the state backgrounds that they observe. So that comes from uh, this D term. And um, so we want this to go to the identity. So this is a bit like a ratio. So we can think of it um, if this R2, if all of the uh, diagonals went to zero, then this would be similar to it going to the identity. So this next case, um, we only have model bias in X1. So that means that the anchor observations don't observe any kind of model bias. So in this case, you can see that this equation is no longer dependent on D, which means that actually the anchor observations don't have an explicit effect on reducing the contamination of model bias. So the anchor observations can't do anything explicitly to help out the help reduce the model bias. Finally, we have the most general case where we just have model bias everywhere and uh, this equation isn't quite as easy to work out what is what we want from it, but we can see that it's dependent on D again. So even though the um, anchor observations are observing different states to the biased observations, they're still all observing model bias. So the anchor observations can reduce the contamination of model bias. So to explore this a bit further, so far we've just looked at theoretically. Um, we've just put this into a simple numerical experiment so that we can look at um, what's going on a bit clearer. So um, in this case, we've used the Lorentz 96 model. So we've got 40 variables and on every other variable, um, we have a observation from either a biased or an anchor observation. So the biased observations observe X0, X2, X4, etc., to X38, and the anchor observations observe all the odd integers, so X1, X3, etc. Along the x-axis, we've um, varied the length scale of B. So if we've got a small length scale down here, not much information is shared between the states. And up here, more information is shared. And on the y-axis, we're showing um, the ratio between the bias in B to A and the random error in B to A. So if this ratio is large, then um, it means that the bias in beta A, so the bias in our observation bias coefficient, is significant compared to the random error. And if it's small, so down here, then it means that the bias in beta A is insignificant compared to the random error. So it will just get lost and it doesn't really matter as much. So um, we've looked at it for our three cases, but here we, the anchor and the biased observations are observing different states. We don't have that crossover. So in our first case um, is the blue one, which is the top line. And here, the biased observations observe states that have model bias, but the anchor observations don't observe any, any model bias. So you can see that this blue line remains quite large throughout. And um, this just shows that no matter how much information is passed from the anchor observations to the biased observations, the anchor observations can't really make any difference to the amount of model bias in the system. In the second case, so that's this orange line, which is given by the second one, um, we have model bias is observed by the anchor observations, but not by the biased observations. So when the length scales are small with this, not much information is being shared. And so actually the ratio is quite, uh, the ratio in the bias coefficient is quite nice. Um, the system isn't seeing any model bias, and so it's not a problem. But as the length scales increase, then more information is shared from the anchor observations to the bias observations. So they're actually passing the model bias into the bias, into the, the biased observations. Um, so this is 
possibly the, well, could be the worst case because either down here, we're not using the anchor observations at all, which are obviously a really useful part of the system. Um, or up here, the anchor observations are actually detr detrimental to the system. So they're contaminating the system with model bias. Finally, um, we've got this green line. So this is just where both observation types are observing model bias. So in this case, you can see that at the start, when not much information is shared between the two, um, the ratio is quite large. So this is similar to the first case because the, the anchor observations just aren't giving much information to the biased observations. As more information is shared, then this ratio decreases. And that's just because the biased of the anchor observations, sorry, are um, they know about the model bias. And so they can kind of feed that information into the biased observations. And therefore they can be the, observa the observations can be corrected with the model bias in mind. So um, overall, we've seen that if the anchor observations and the bias corrected obs observations observe the same states, so for instance, um, H1, 2 here and H2, then we want more precise anchor observations than the state backgrounds. If they're observing different states, so this is H11 compared to H2, um, but they have a similar model bias, so for instance, this last case, then we want large background error covariances to be shared, sorry, large background error covariances so that more information about the model bias can be shared into the biased observations. Finally, if the bias corrected and anchor observations are observing different states and they have different model biases, so this is these first two cases, then there's a danger that either the anchor observations won't be used in the, anchor, in the observation bias correction or they'll be detrimental to the bias correction. So overall, this means that observation bias correction will have more contamination from model bias in locations with fewer anchor observations. So it's these locations that we should be more wary of, um, especially if we know that there's model bias there, um, because, well, obviously they'll just have less of an effect of reducing the contamination to model bias. Um, yeah, that's everything, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. But is that systematic? I mean, that's estimated people. Satellite, right? Because it changes. It's a nightmare in these satellite data. Anyone who works in the area, it's a real nightmare. Right, anyway. <laughs> and, and what is the relative size between model errors? Model biases typically, and, and, and these uh, uh, biases. Yeah. Same order, or in general, they. Yeah. So in general, the um, the observation biases are bigger, but because we're reducing the observation biases, the model biases are now becoming more of a problem. So the model biases are smaller than the observation biases, but now that we're able to correct the observation biases more, the model biases, are, yeah, just becoming more prominent. Yeah, no, this was a bit where I forgot about it in my presentation. So um, radio sons are used and also radio occultation um, is being used more. In situ observations, 
I mean, except that you have to anchor it. Also, it's the only thing that can anchor you. Anything else? I mean, you're not going to be like. No, but this would have to be an online experiment, right? It's, you do not want to use this alongside the data center. You have to, uh, yeah, this is not part of the. It's not part of the same problem, this entanglement test. You don't have to do this online. You don't have to do this sequentially. Sure, sure, sure. sure. No? Yeah, I mean, you can't show it. I mean, it's covered. I mean, that's okay. You have very different operation types, so yeah. and you you know, find these those <coughs> so, so uh, what 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 fires and what screws right? and you have different operation types that create different types of errors. Yeah. Take advantage of that and involve these seniors trying to really do that through the process of data generation and trying to get <coughs> other observations correct by the satellite. Very typical of this. I mean, it's a Uh, yeah, so I think I'm I'm not planning on doing that, but I think it'll be a useful thing to do, um, especially with, so for instance, the bias predictors that are set up, like the bias correction function, um, they're set up to explicitly, well, potentially disentangle some model biases. So it would be interesting to use more experimental, um, that's not the right word, operational um, data to see if that works any better. But um, yeah, I'm not planning on that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>